everyone. Uh, so I know the story has been read a lot, but um, I thought I would take a try at it since I'm going to be doing a sort of summer theme for this upcoming summer, since I'll actually be posting regularly. So um, I really hope you enjoy my narration, and this is Mr. Teeth by Daniel Du Bois. People sometimes ask me what my first memory is. Invariably I lie, because I'm prone to avoid the explanation that comes with the truth. Maybe, from now on, if someone casually asks me, What's your first memory? I will reach into my bag where there will be copies of the story, and I will just hand one over. As they read it, their face will morph from confusion into the furrowed brow of concern, and finally into the drop-jawed bewilderment that accompanies real fear. In passing, I tell people that my first memory was of me standing on a stool in front of my kitchen window. It was just after dusk in winter, and where I stood, I could make out the black limbs of the skeletal beech tree that loomed across the driveway. While this is indeed a real memory, it's not my first one. If you want to hear about that, here it is. There was an unfortunate series of incidences that happened in the town where I grew up during the summer of 1989. By incidences, I mean murders. I'm not talking about your run-of-the-mill bar brawl gone too far or an act of passionate revenge. No, the events that happened in Middleton were far more grotesque, even more so because the victims were children. I don't remember the heat wave that had swept Middleton that summer, the pink droplets of melted ice cream on the simmering pavement, or the old men reclined in overstuffed chairs in shady living rooms. These precious details were told to me through family members and friends of my parents. They all, to this day, say it was the hottest summer they had ever lived through. To make the weather even more unbearable, there were weekly brownouts that year due to some oversights at the electrical plant in Salem. As a result, homes and businesses would go for hours at a time without air conditioning. Popsicles were promptly sold out in every business afternoon. Magazines and newspapers weren't read that summer. They were bought to be used as makeshift fans. It seems the only place where air conditioning still remained during these outages was the car. I had been told by relatives that it was not uncommon that summer to find neighbors lounging in their parked cars with the windows up, drinking a beer and listening to the radio. At times, it was the only escape from the unbearable humidity and heat. That's why, when mothers would go shopping, it became impossible to pull their children from the cars. After all, the kids knew that inside of whatever clothing or grocery store their mothers had taken them to was probably hot, if not hotter, than the parking lot. The coolest and best place to be was in the car, with the windows rolled up and the gentle, whispering wind seeping through the vents. With this setting in mind, you can understand how... Mr. Teeth, as he was later called by newspapers, had his pick of the litter, so to speak. He knew in any given lot outside of a busy grocery store or department store, there would be at least two or three cars where children had been left inside. One such car was parked outside of the market basket on the afternoon of June 3rd. Within sat Jeremy Hager, a freckled eight-year-old with a penchant for action figures. When Jeremy's mother returned from her quick dash for butter, she found the back right door of the vehicle ajar, a Darth Vader doll left abandoned on the back seat. News of the disappearance radiated through the town over the following week, up until the day when a jogger noticed a small black Reebok laying in the grass on the edge of the reservoir. Not long afterwards, Jeremy's body was pulled from the brown water and sent to the morgue. It was there that the doctors noted what appeared to be bite marks on the boy's arms and neck. Victim number two was Amanda DeMiller, a girl of seven who had fallen asleep on her way home from shopping with her mother on July 18th. As was common in those days, a parent might leave their sleeping child in a car once at home. Freda DeMiller, Amanda's mother, later told the police that with the house being as hot as it was, she thought that Amanda would sleep better in the car with the sliding side door left open. At some point, Mr. Miller looked out the window and saw that Amanda was no longer in the seat. 
The family lived on a fairly wooded road leading to the forest of Middleton. Neighbors were widely separated from one another. Mr. and Mrs. DeMiller spent all of their nights scouring the narrow back roads, knocking on the doors of the occasional houses. <sighs> After only a three-day search, a local boy found Amanda's body slumped in the corner of a treehouse. Her throat was purple from strangulation and covered in bite marks. Her shoes were on the wrong feet. Anyway, that's how the story goes. That brings us to my first memory. My parents have since placed the date of this memory to around the third or fourth week of August. It had been around a month since Amanda de Miller's murder, but no one had been apprehended. People in the town were still on edge. It was at that time, one afternoon, I sat in the front seat of my mom's dusty Toyota, parked in the giant lot of Henry's grocery store. I remember that there was a car parked on either side of my mother's, and in front of the Toyota was one of those corrals for shopping carts. There was music playing quietly on the radio. Donna, maybe? And my hands were sticky from eating candy. I wonder how, with all of these horrors that had plagued Middleton that summer, my mother could have left me alone in the car. The fact is, she hadn't. My older brother, Stephen, age 12 at the time, had been designated as my temporary guardian while she made an emergency stop for flour. It was this temporary guardian who decided that this was the perfect opportunity to run to the bookstore nearby and buy a deck of collectible cards. Before he dashed out of the back seat, I remember him saying something like, Don't go anywhere! So I sat there, waiting for one or both of my family members to return. It was then that I saw him, and it's this part which is clear even to this day. The halogen lamps had just come on all across the lot. They cast that greenish glow from just being turned on. The sky beyond the pines was bordering the market and was streaked with pink and purple. It must have been around 7.30. I remember first seeing him, standing some 30 feet from the front of her car. Almost instantly, the music from the radio faded out of my ears, along with the rattle of carriage wheels on the old pavement. Transfix, silent, I stared out of the windshield at his lanky god figure, framed by a pink and purple sky. Through a curtain of greasy black hair falling across his brow, I discerned a single eye. It seemed to sort of take on a green glow of those halogen lights. He tilted his head back a bit, and the hint of a smile danced across his thin lips. He must have stood and stared through the windshield at me, transfixed and spelled around as I was for one whole minute. Then he started a slow walk over to the side of my car, never taking his eye from mine. Once he was outside my door, he looked down, his long beak-like nose at me, and looking around, he began to wiggle the handle. Open up, he said, looking down at me. I had stared at him without saying anything. Again. Open up. His long, skeletal fingers left the door handle and started to dance across my window, tapping here and there. He crouched down so that he was at my level and started a sort of puppet show with his hands. His dirty fingers dashed across the glass like a great pale spider's in a deadly battle. He looked at them and laughed, making hissing and growling noises. As he made these sounds, his mouth opened up into a full grin and I had a look inside at rows of long, yellow teeth. They are, to this day, the longest and largest teeth I have ever seen. There were gaps between them, and they reminded me vaguely of dirty piano keys. He seemed to be completely immersed in his spider battle, giggling and clawing at each of his hands. At one point, he noticed my window was open just a crack at the top. He looked at me, grinning with those mighty teeth, and crawled one of his hand spiders up into the space. I was openly sobbing at this point. He managed to squeeze the fingertips of four fingers through the opening. I caught a greasy whiff of unwashed clothes mingled with the sweet scent of blood. Come on, open up, he said in a whiny, 
pleading voice. Open up, he said. The same sentence in a dozen different voices, from a girly voice to a thick lumberjack one. By sheer luck, the woman who was parked on the passenger side of our car returned with all four of her noisy kids now. Upon seeing her, the man scurried off in the duck walk towards the cart corral, where he smoothly stood up straight and walked into the parking lot, but not before looking over his shoulder, gnashing those giant teeth and catching me with one final blood-chilling stare. <sighs> the memory ends there. It was later explained to me that my brother had returned to the car to find me crying, hysterically. No matter what he said to calm me down through the glass, apparently I wouldn't unlock the doors. My mother returned soon after. She said all I could manage was to say through thick sobs was, There was a man! I just kept repeating it for hours after that. There was a man! Like the insufferable heat, so too did the Middleton murders come to an end with the changing of the seasons. Just two weeks after my parking lot encounter, the child killer, who was later identified as Raymond Sandler, age 29, was caught taking a young girl from a birthday party at a roller rink in Beverly. A worker on his coffee break at the adjacent gas station saw a thin man lead the girl to the back door of the rink and attempt to force her into a red car. The worker called the cops and the car was pulled over on Route 128, just outside of Gloucester. While I don't remember it, I made the first connection between the man in the parking lot and Mr. Teeth by seeing my father's newspaper on the coffee table that day after Sandler's capture. There, in large, blown up black and white, was the same ghastly face I had seen inches from mine, with only a layer of glass separating us. Apparently, I didn't make it to school that day. I saw that newspaper on account of I couldn't stop screaming. Knowing that I had almost been victim myself, my family and the people around Middleton weren't willing to tell me anything about the killer once I grew curious years later. I suppose they didn't want me to freak out more than I already was. So in high school, I did some of my own research. I learned that the Boston Globe had first coined the nickname Mr. Teeth on account of Sandler's unusually large incisors and his habit of biting the skin of his victims. This means his means of killing were almost exclusively strangulation. Due to his being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, Sandler was often delusional. As a result, his story regularly changed. However, after being asked several times the number of murders he confessed to, while varying, never went above ten. It was also noted in research that Sandler, on Sandler that he only hunted in the summertime. Some speculated that this was because of easy access to the children, who had been left in cool cars while their parents went into shop. Others suggested that the hot weather triggered something inside of Sandler, something that lay dormant during fall and winter, then awoke once temperatures hit 80. <sighs> who can say? The years have softened that first memory a bit. I'm almost 40 now. And while that hideous grin isn't quite as distinct as it used to be, I still see it sometimes when I wake up at night, usually in the warmer months. Someday, my two girls, who know nothing of the summer of 89, may ask when they're older, Hey Dad, what's your first memory? Maybe I'll tell them about the time I was on the stool in my kitchen, looking out at the old beech tree. Or maybe I'll just say, teeth. I remember teeth.